In today's world, faith isn't about easy answers. Faith is about asking hard questions, following your curiosity, making a difference. At the Candler Foundry, we believe in a world in which you can consider new perspectives, find your purpose, reimagine what's possible. When we come together to learn, grow, explore, belong. Welcome to Publications, a webinar series hosted by the Candler Foundry at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. The Candler Foundry is designed to bring opportunities for rich theological learning beyond the walls of the seminary, making them accessible and engaging for everyone. In that spirit, this webinar series features discussions of newly published academic works and invites the broader public into the important conversations that these books engage. My name is Elizabeth Arnold, also known as E.B., and I'm the postdoctoral fellow and New Testament teacher for the Candler Foundry. I have the pleasure of being your Foundry host this afternoon. We're thrilled to have you joining us for today's discussion with Reverend Dr. Deanna Womack, one of the editors of the newly published book, Alterity and the Evasion of Justice, Explorations of the Other in World Christianity. Reverend Dr. Deanna Womack is Associate Professor of History of Religions and Interfaith Studies, as well as the Director of the Master of Religious Leadership Program here at Candler School of Theology. Dr. Womack, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I would love to offer this opportunity for you to tell us about this book. Um, maybe what prompted it? Um, how did it come into being? What are some of the things that you learned along the way and who you got to work with as you were um, serving as one of the, the main editors for this volume? Thank you so much, Evie. And again, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to engaging with um, other colleagues discussing the book as well. Um, so I, I had the chance to work with so many people as part of this book since it's an edited volume, but I'll say that it began with an invitation from Dr. Uh, Raimundo Barreto, who is a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary. He's also the editor of the Fortress World uh, Christianity series, and he invited me um, to, to consider co-editing this book with him. Um, he proposed that the starting point for this volume might be a conference session that he and I had participated in, along with two other scholars um, who are authors of chapters in this book, Moses Biney and James Tenetti. Um, and that panel had focused on the concept of otherness in world Christianity and neglected issues of social justice. Um, so as we began conceiving the book, we asked um, this question, which voices and experiences remain marginalized within Christian communities around the globe? And then in conceiving of this larger book project, we sought out scholars in various global contexts who have been working to lift up these neglected voices. And so I'm glad that two of them can join us today, um, Fulata Moyo and Ana Esther Padua Frieri. Um, the, the book itself and its subject seemed especially important at this moment um, because the field of world Christianity is moving from an emerging um, new field to one that's a little bit more established in institutions and book series. And, and we see conferences now regularly on topics of world Christianity. Um, the field's pioneers in the late 1980s and 90s, um, they had questions of justice in mind then when they challenged scholars to decenter Eurocentric presumptions about Christianity. Um, and to attend to the remarkable growth and the vibrancy of Christians around the world, far beyond the US or Europe. Um, 
So built into the field itself is an attentiveness to the margins, which we really appreciate. Um, but now that the field is several decades old, we wanted to invite people to pause um, and reassess and ask um, who might be treated as other in global Christian contexts, um, both by the scholarly field and within particular Christian communities themselves. Um, so the book uh, encourages scholars to think about the field's development, um, but it also encourages students and Christians around the globe um, who may um, see their own fight for justice reflected in some of the stories that are told in the volume. Um, I suppose the last thing that I'll say is I hope that any reader would gain a more expansive understanding of who these Christians are in multiple contexts in Asia, Africa, Latin America, as well as um, in the United States um, and in Europe. Um, these include women, um, but there are particular groups that we find are still on the margins. And so these include women in the global south, sexual minorities, queer Christians especially, um, who are minoritized and who are not treated in the world Christianity literature, um, as well as members of other faith traditions who aren't brought into the study of world Christianity, in particular regions of the world that are sometimes neglected. Those might include uh, the Middle East as well as parts of Latin America. So I hope that the expansiveness of the tradition is more apparent to those who are able to read the book. Oh my word, that is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for anyone who hasn't read the book, it is marvelous and varied. Um, I think it does such a wonderful job of capturing, like you said, how expansive that other is. Um, and uh, if I can plug for anyone, uh, it is from Fortress Press. So definitely um, get a copy if you haven't, for those of us who are um, just joining us to, to checking it out. Um, so I would love to bring on the panelists that you've chosen to be able to chat about this book. Um, so if our panelists could join us. Uh, today with us, we have uh, Dr. Kwok Pulan, Dr. Anna Esther, Dr. Fulada Moyo. Welcome, thank you so much. Um, just like Dr. Womack, uh, I would love to hear, and I'm sure our audience would love to hear your take on your relationship to this uh, to this volume, either uh, what you've contributed or what you've discerned and processed and loved about it. So please feel free, um, whoever would like to go first. Maybe I should uh, begin because I am not a contributor to the book. Well, the other the panelists are. And uh, when I uh, received the manuscript from uh, Dr. Warbeck uh, to endorse the book, I was delighted uh, because I was looking for something like this for some time. In one book that you have the so-called forgotten voices or the neglected voices. So I am especially grateful for the opening session of the book that talks about methodology, how the construction of otherness secure the so-called norms of the field, why those voices are marginalized, and uh, what can we bring justice to lift up those voices. I learned a lot uh, by reading this book, uh, especially regarding Latin American uh, contributions to world Christianity and uh, of course, uh, Dr. Warbeck's own uh, contribution from the Arab uh, Christian's point of view, because sometimes we do not include Middle East in the study of world Christianity. I also appreciate the two contributors who are joining us today um, for their work, lifting up queer theory and the colonial theory. You will be uh, happy to know, uh, Dr. Maria, that we actually discussed your chapter yesterday in one of my classes. And I am also very appreciative to uh, Dr. Amoyu's work on lifting up the story of your mother and her profound work uh, mm -hmm. on behalf of women and children in the African context. Thank you for bringing out this volume so we will have a taste of the diversity and variety of scholarship in world Christianity. 
Dr. Moyo, would you like to respond and tell us a bit about your contribution to the book, um, especially this, this beautiful, heartbreaking, but beautiful story about your mother? Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, yes, um, actually, uh, before I was invited to contribute, I, I had not thought of uh, my mother's experience and the uh, and the the, the silence uh, that the the, ch the church how the church has not handled uh, that particular experience of child marriage uh, in a particular way as the the other thing. and uh, so when I started uh, thinking about it and uh, and uh, really I remembered that actually for my mother she she really was so committed to 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 her church but uh, because she was married very young and she married to she was 15 when she got married to my father and my father was 39 years of age and he, she couldn't be married in the church because my father already had two other wives and uh, so for me, I think uh, it was really a very important experience for me to go through the retelling of my mother's story and then bring up also the reality that actually it didn't end with her. This story is repeated over and over again, even today as we speak. So yeah, it's... Uh, um, it's it's a story that uh, I would really uh, I would encourage other people also to pick up their own story. So when I shared this story, I hoped that other people can also find um, the safety enough to talk about the experiences that they know. Yeah. I I will stop there for now, but I I have so many more things to say. Well, I think that you brought up a very very um, prominent theme that's a thread throughout the book is that um, what's where is this tension between so many people who are committed to their churches, like your mother to hers, and then what's the commitment of the church to these people, and that there's this this constant tension of people giving and committed to the church. And it's time to ask this question, how committed is the church to these others? Mm -hmm. um, I would love to hear what, if anyone else wants to respond to that or pick up that thread. Well, I was just going to note that um, I think the same thread appears in Anna Esther's work. So I would turn things over to her. But the the commitment of of um, queer Christians in both Protestant and Catholic contexts in Brazil, and they're they're wanting to be part of a Christian community and not necessarily finding a place, and so having to work together to to make a place for themselves. Um, but perhaps Anna, um, you could share a little bit more about your work along those lines. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much for invitation to be here. I'm really glad. It's such an honor to be among so amazing women. I'm Ana Esther. I'm a postdoctoral fellow from Universidade Federal de Juiz de Fora in Brazil. And I'm the writer of the chapter Marginal Desire and Submissive Transit Between the Center and the Margin of Christianity to Brazilian Cases. As Dr. Diana said, I share in this chapter the two Brazilian cases, the Evangelicals for Diversity and National Network of LGBT Catholic Groups, which are groups that claim themselves to be um, Christians despite of the way hegemonic Christianity has been treating all of us queer people uh, uh, throughout the history. So I'm a cisgender and lesbian woman I'm a queer theologian and I was, I claim myself to be evangelical, which would be something like evangelical in English. Uh, it's, it's hard to be here today because of the language. Having the, the English as a second language, it's not easy. It's been more than a year since I've spoken one single word in English. So I'm kind of nervous and I excuse myself for that. 
And I really want to, to uh, start by saying how amazing was the opportunity to write. First of all, I had to have a couple of people helping me a lot with the writing because it's hard to speak. Can we imagine even more to write in English for me? And I thank Dr. Raimundo Barreto and Dr. Diana for helping me in the editing of this chapter. I would love to hear more about your process of editing, Dr. Diana. And because I know I gave her such a hard time with trying to put my ideas into a language that it's not mine. This is something that I challenge, um, a challenge that we needed to overcome because of the language. That's why it's so for us in Brazil, in Latin America specifically, it's so uh, great to be able to publish something in English and to spread out our ideas. In my chapter, I use uh, two different concepts, uh, desire and margin. And the idea of margin is to understand those groups that I was analyzing, understanding how they kept the main core of Christianity by with continuities, but also with ruptures, uh, uh, claiming themselves to be part of Christian, but not also the Christian tradition, which has uh, put away, kept away so many queer in the history. I would love to talk more and engage with the questions. Well, I love what you what you noted about language because for those of us who appear on the screen, actually the majority um, don't have English as their first language, and this is a reality of world Christianity. So um, I'm grateful to be able to be part of this context, um, and it might also be helpful to know that this Fortress series in world Christianity actually every um, book that's uh, published in English will be translated into Portuguese um, to reach a, a larger um, group of. Uh, um, of world Christians to make um, to make the scholarship more accessible. So I think you you raise a really important point about communication and and probably the hegemony of of um, English language scholarship. But there are certain ways that um, that especially through world Christianity publishing we can try to um, to move beyond the single language academic textbook and share um, the message of the kinds of stories that that both um, um, you Anna Esther and and Fulata Moyo have shared with us. What is special about this book and also this series is that it is a collaboration between Fortress and or the Princeton Theological mm. School Seminary with another institutions in Brazil. Talking about language, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Ferreira this question. Um, your book uh, talks about the late uh, theologian, um, Marcella uh, Alphias Reed. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how um, her work has been important for you? So your chapter talks about queer theory and especially talking about Marcella Alphias Reed. Yes. So why is she important to you? Yes, so I've been studying Marcella. My I have a love story with Marcella. For those who do, doesn't know, don't know her, she is she was an Argentine, Argentinian uh, theologian who died uh, 15 years ago, and she has this amazing production of more than 50 chapters, but only three books only written by her. And one is Queer God, the other is um, uh, in the Indecent Theology, and the other one from Feminist Theology to Indecent Theology. And Marcella, she, she rescued me because I was cast away from my church my evangelical church because I was, I was a, 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 I am a lesbian woman and I was for almost 10 years outside the church because I didn't know there was a church that could accept me as I am. So I, I was a journalist and I, I wanted to study more about theology to see if there was a way for me to reconnect myself with God. And I started studying theology in a Methodist um, school. And in the first class of school, I've heard 
the first time about Marcela Altausrit. And Marcela, she just talked to my heart because she gave me the opportunity of being myself and doing theology. And more than that, you rediscovering God. So it's been like 10 years since I've been investing a lot of my time uh, studying about Marcela. Now in my postdoctoral fellow, I'm studying her because I always think she can contribute more and stretch more the idea of God and the idea of epistemology. How can we study the, the religious phenomenon by queer lenses? And so for me to engage with Marcela for this specific chapter was easy because she gives me a lot of ideas about margin and marginal and especially one of one of her writings where she she claims that we want to know a marginal god not a god that visits the margin and not even a god that is marginalized or which means that is put in the margin but a god that is in the margin from the margin speaking from that specific social place so for this because they used to say um, the margin is a destination for LGBT people, but I think that's the place where we celebrate ourselves. That's the place where we want to be. We don't want to be in the center of power. We want to be in the fringes of it, doing what we want. We love to do more, most, which is knowing God and celebrating our bodies. Uh, in reconnection with God. So Marcel Altausrid is such an important um, um, theologian that should be known more from not only the North, global North, but also the South, global South, because she has amazing contributions about how can we discover queer God. Um, thank go you, ahead. Dr. Anna. Oh, go ahead. Am I interrupting? No, no, I, I wanted to ask Anna um, whether she, in person, she met her in person. No, was... she's just a platonic love. I, I, I didn't have the opportunity of meeting her. Um, my my, my postdoctoral uh, supervisor, Andre Muscov, he, he met with her, he published with her, but so he tells me a lot of stories about her, but I hadn't had the opportunity. And I had the opportunity. I first met Masala in 2000, when we both spoke at the uh, uh, event in uh, Liverpool in UK. Mm. And um, so at that time, the indigenous uh, theology book was about to come out. So I was very excited. And then we organized a panel at the annual meeting of the American Academy of Religion to discuss this groundbreaking book. Mm. Since then, uh, I also collaborated um, with her on a number of occasions. And just like you said, uh, her work is just so pioneering that uh, this queer God, the God as a stranger, mm. always captures my imagination. And there is so much tie in with the focus of this volume Alterity and justice. Mm -hmm. The queer God is always a God as a stranger. It cannot be domesticated. We cannot just uh, hold it uh, with uh, boundaries. So thank you very much for lifting up um, Masala in blessed memory. Thank you. I think we can see the um, the power of um, Althaus Reed's um, work. Um, in this volume, also in the chapter that comes right after yours, Anna Esther, um, which is a chapter by Eve Parker, who studies um, Devadasis, or um, in India, were also known as temple prostitutes, and she uses indecent theology there as well to understand the experiences of these women. Um, so it's a really powerful um, work, I think, that applies in, in a lot of um, studies um, in, in world Christianity and beyond. Um, and I appreciate authors like you who have have drawn from outside the established field of world Christianity to bring us into some of these questions of theory and theology that otherwise aren't um, aren't so prominent 
in, um, in, in the, the published literature in the field. I'm really grateful for that. I wanted to ask a question to, um, to Fulata, if I may, um, because you wrote about your mother's experience um, after, after she had passed away. So you didn't have the chance to you know, interview her and use her responses in your chapter, but instead you took a really uh, creative autoethnographic approach um, by writing a letter to yourself as if it was from your mother. Um, and it's, it's so beautiful and, and heartbreaking at the same time. And I wonder if you could talk about that process and what you learned um, about your mother from, from that letter that you constructed. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, as, uh, as you know, you know, because we had a lot of conversation, you and me, about uh, uh, this approach. And uh, it was actually, it really helped me uh, writing that letter, helped me to put into um, a kind of like conversation with myself, but uh, drawing from all the information that she had given me. Um, I'm somebody who, I was the last born. I, I was born when, when she was in her forties and he, always I was a very curious person. And I remember that several times I, I was very bothered by the fact that he, she knew she was marrying a man who already had two wives. Mm. You know, so I kept on bothering her, why did you do this? Why did you do this? So when she opened up, to talk to me about uh, her abuse, that uh, at 12 years of age, she had already, 12 or 13, she had already married uh, uh, a younger man. And then he, you know, Northern Malawi, uh, m m there's, there are several districts, but Muzimba district is where the Ngoni, the people who, who migrated from South Africa, from the Zulu Kingdom, settled there. And uh, most of them, I think because of that connection to South Africa, that's where we came from, they always thought in terms of, if we are to end poverty, we have to go back and work in South Africa. So uh, even the young man that my mother first got married to, left her to go and make money in South Africa. And so when I was asking her all the time, why did you marry an already married man? And she said, you know, I got married to a single man who went to South Africa and he, I was abused by the uncle because he was not there and he, the uncle started abusing her. And so at a very young age, she decided she was going to divorce, so she left. And when she left, when she went back, the brother started abusing her because of family dishonor. And so when my father, who was in, oh, old enough, like twice her age, started approaching her, she had to think about whether to stay where the brother was abusing her every time or whether to marry the, the man who was already married. So she said, to marry your father was uh, a better option for me. And uh, so when I was writing that letter, as a letter that she had written, I was uh, also, it really helped me also to have deeper conversation with her without her being there. Yeah. And it really also helped me uh, to to actually sort out my own biases that I had carried on because I really, like, I judged her very unfairly most of the time. Mm. So that writing the letter was a very important process for me to actually come to a point where I could appreciate how strong my mother was mm. and how even the choices she made were not easy choices. Yeah, so it was a very important process for me. It's interesting by listening to Dr. Fulata to think about 
this otherness as being our ancestors. Me dealing with Marcela Altaus Lieben, mm -hmm. with her mother. You, need, you know, it's a way of, I, I believe this is a way of decolonizing our history, it's dealing with our ancestry, ancestors, honoring them, giving voice to different histories, not the history that has been told by the the white cisgender rich men from the north, global north, but giving voice to those other women who is part of us, who help us to be who we are. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but maybe I can, I can also ask a question to Anna, actually, because of who, the way you are really connecting these us talking to our ancestors in a particular way, uh, like you you did with Marcel. Um, did you feel like when you were writing about her, did you feel like you were kind of like given a chance to talk with her? Because I felt like I was given another chance to talk to my mother. Oh, this is beautiful. Yes, for sure. Um, this, I, I'm not sure when the invitation for writing this chapter came, but it was between pandemic and the quote and quote end of pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it was such a hard time because I was living abroad. I was living in the US and I was just focused writing and the idea of having Marcela with me and being able to exchange my ideas with her really helped me through the whole process of uh, being in pandemic so uh, yes i truly believe sometimes i talk to her saying like what else can i say that you haven't said before and i'm always feel like she's pushing me to say more especially because even she's in Lat she was in latin america and me too but in brazil we had a different context like for example brazil is the number one a uh, country in the world that kills transgender people. Every 29 hours, one LGBTQI plus people is, is dead in Brazil. So we have these crazy numbers about violence against LGBT people. And so it, she helps me to bring out my, um, my context. So yes, helping me a lot to to imagine myself. That's a way for us, like to embrace our our ministry and this ministry of writing, right? This this action that we I like the word, the the name of this series, public actions, uh, because it's a way of to show how it's not public only, but it's our action. It's the way we are dealing with reality. So yes, thank you for Lata for this question and thank you for sharing your story with your mama with us. Well, just one last question. Since we've heard from two of these contributors where you both talked about um, maybe what surprised you while you were writing um, and the things that came up for you. Uh, Dr. Womack, as you were editing this, were you surprised by anything, any of the contributions where you didn't expect to see that and you were confronted with something that really struck you as outside of what you would have thought? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a really important question, I think, to ask of any, uh, about any book. I mean, I think um, the only the only chapter where I had any specific expertise on the subject was the chapter that I wrote about Arab American Christians. And so, um, I learned so much from each, um, yeah, from each contributor writing on their own particular context, either either the context in which they live or the context um, on which they um, study. So what I don't know what surprised me most. I think um, I think seeing the interconnections between some of the um, the chapters. We didn't necessarily have a vision for how each part of the book would uh, necessarily come together, and so once we received all the contributions, um, seeing the interconnections and deciding. Um, oh, we need a ch we need um, a section on um, biblical and theological perspectives, and um, that's where Anna Esther's um, 
chapter uh, appears, for example, or we need one on not just on feminism, but also on gender broadly, which would include explorations of, of masculinity. There's a chapter by J. Paul Hines, a Princeton Seminary professor, um, which is really important looking at masculinity. So, um, I mean, I think I was just, rather than being surprised, I was pleased at the diversity of, of subjects and conversations and stories um, that were offered when people um, submitted their, their first drafts of these chapters. And then, and I appreciated seeing some of the, the connections um, between, between several of them. Um, we hadn't necessarily thought about the, the book as sort of pushing the margins in terms of interreligious conversations. Um, but of course, this is the reality of world Christianity that, um, that in many places, especially outside of, of the West, um, Christians are in constant encounter with people of other faiths. And so it was a natural part of, of the conversation, um, or at least four or five of the chapters. And that's one, one area of world Christianity that we wanted to, um, that um, I guess we, we tuned into once we realized that the contributors were finding this as well. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there, but I, I'll continue contemplating that question because I think it's, it's an important one. And I really um, enjoyed the learning experience finding out about um, the particular context that each um, author was writing about. I also have a question for you, Deanna. Uh, it is because in the introduction, you and uh, uh, the writer talks about uh, sometimes the theological voices are not included. Yes. Oh, you have several chapters that talk specifically about theology, for mm -hmm. example, Anna's uh, chapter. But I, uh, as a theologian, um, am always surprised uh, why uh, theology seemingly is not a major focus uh, in the study of world Christianity. Yeah. Yes, this is a great question. The field, as I've experienced it at least, is very well populated by historians. And then secondarily, I think by ethnographers or those who would study in some way contemporary communities um, through observation and through, through interviewing. Um, and although theologians are sometimes present at, at big um, uh, World Christianity conferences, and I know there's one coming up in Ghana where you, Dr. Kwok, will, will be present, um, it seems that the field as its core has been um, one toward which historians have gravitated. I think that's partly because it emerged from the study of the history of missions. And then there was a shift to, to center world Christianity, but the, the disciplinary focus was still there. Um, I do think if we, if we would simply expand who's part of the conversation, we already have so many people doing theology in global contexts that we would want to include um, in in world Christianity as a field, um, but those voices aren't appearing in, in sort of the, the pioneering text of the field, I guess is, is what I would say. And so um, so I think looking at the, the question of gender as well as sexuality, that was really apparent for us um, that scholars are, are looking beyond the bounds of the field of world Christianity to find the theories and the theologies especially um, to to uphold those studies. So it's a it's an important observation and one that I hope um, as scholars will continue to um, to think about why why is this the case and what can we do to expand the boundaries of the field so that the theological voices that are that are out there um, feel more invited to be part of this conversation. Thank you so much. We have um, quite a few questions from our audience, and it looks like the first one, Deanna, is a question about the title, oh, okay. um, which I think is a great question. Titles matter. Um, and so how did you choose that? And can you parse a little bit of what each of those words like evasion of justice and alterity mean in relation to all of these different essays? Yeah, so alterity and the evasion of justice. So. So alterity to us meant um, otherness, who, who is being treated as other within the field um, or within particular global Christian contexts. Um, and so, so there is an aspect of justice there, I think, at least, at least the way we were conceiving of the project, um, that othering always is an injustice. And so there's, there's a problem to be rectified. Um, and I think the, the question though was asking more about the, um, the evasion of justice and what does that mean? That particular terminology came from the conference I mentioned, the Princeton Theological Seminary World Christianity Conference, um, where four of us um, presented. And um, in particular, I think it was inspired by Moses Biney's piece, which is on Pentecostalism in, um, in African uh, contexts. 
And, and he was pointing to the, the way that justice is evaded, is overlooked, is um, not centered um, in certain um, Pentecostal practices. Um, uh, and I think that we could, we could certainly push beyond Pentecostalism to say across global Christian contexts as well as in the global North, um, that there are, there are set practices in Christian communities that evade justice. Um, but I think the point that he made really well, which was impressed upon me, is that um, sometimes scholars in the in the global north, um, white Christian scholars who um, are interested in world Christianity and want to rectify kind of the Eurocentric nature of the study of Christianity, have then hesitated um, to comment on injustices that we see within Christian communities. So marginalization of queer Christ Christians, for example, or the experience of, of Fulata's mother and the way that because she was in a polygamous marriage, she wasn't fully accepted in the Presbyterian church in Malawi. Um, we might hesitate to, to, um, to mention those evasions of justice um, because of our own positionality. And so it's been important then for, for scholars um, like you all and those that appear in the book um, to point out the, the, um, yeah, the contradictions of justice um, that, are, that are not being addressed, um, both in churches and in, in the scholarly field. Thank you. We have an um, an anonymous uh, commenter who did not want to reveal who they are, asked this question um, really, I think for our broader audience, um, which is that it's really hard to make these conversations more mainstream. And there's lots of resistance that you all have pointed out, not just in um, scholarly circles, but in religious circles and in society in general, Dr. Esther talked about like this widespread violence. Um, so the person's asking, what can we do to help the issue? What about the people who aren't clergy and aren't scholars? How, what, what advice or counsel would you give people who don't fit into those categories? How can they take what's in this book and use it to actually help this issue and make this difference of alterity and justice? Yeah. I love that question. And I'd love to hear what Anna and Fulata would say because you've done so much uh, activist work on the ground among people who aren't scholars and who aren't clergy and, and who are making a difference. Um, so how would you, how would you advise the, the person asking that question? Would you mind clarifying the question for me, please? Let's see, can we put the question back up on the screen? So the, the I think the best way to, to think about it is what can people who aren't scholars and aren't clergy, how can they make the conversation that this book is facilitating and that we're having here, how can they make bring this into the mainstream and help make these issues um, part of the bigger conversation in societies? Okay. I, th I think, first of all, they are part already of the conversation because I'm bringing, um, showing stories that it's not from clergy or uh, academic people, but it's from people from the ground. I'm a social media activist, and as Dr. Diana said, and uh, I'm really involved in the ground doing uh, educação popular, popular education by Paulo Freire and bringing the ideas of the, the Bible to a more popular and queering process. And so I think those stories are there. Fulata's mother's stories in the book, I think, I think these stories are encouraging us that the, it's, it's a turning point of view of this question. You know, it's, it's more for us to hear what they are already saying. Uh, who are the otherness? Who are those people on the margins saying things relevant that can change our reality? It's more about us listening to them than us giving them voice because they have their own voice already. Oh, um, I love that. No, I, I wanted to also add to say, yes, actually, um, like in, in my story, actually, I am also uh, wrestling with the question of who uh, women's spaces, like the women's guild uh, in the church, which is, they are not theologians, um, and they they are like 
just uh, uh, most of the times women that uh, care about their families and all that. But I, I think for, for me also, I've learned like uh, for the sake of concerned African women theologians that uh, I belong to, we have found that uh, most of the times um, the use of like uh, contextual Bible study methodologies help really bring in, uh, bring in people that are not uh, equipped as theologians, but uh, they they still hold on to the Bible as the as if he, you know like he, that that it is it's a very important book in their life and yet most of the times the way they read it is, is sometimes can actually marginalize them so when you use contextual bible study for for example uh in in just uh groups with people uh and and and, and just engage with them uh, to raise issues about their concerns and 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 see how they actually embody the Bible in a particular way or how a particular uh, biblical passage really is not very helpful for them. Uh, we found that uh, such helps them to actually uh, start uh, wrestling with the issues without uh, um, actually disadvantaging themselves. So we have another question that actually goes really well with that, um, Dr. Falada. Um, someone asked, um, what are the social and cultural forces that have played a role in women's marginalization and this feeling of otherness in different parts of Africa? And so it's interesting that you say the Bible actually plays a role in othering and the Bible can also be used in order to do what the second part of this question asks, how can it be used to confront and reshape those narratives? Are there other forces that you want to talk about, like that, like you have with the Bible? Yeah. Well, I mean, like in in Africa, actually, we have many layers uh, uh, that have really so many times worked against us, but it can also be uh, appropriated to change the narrative. So we, we have, like, uh, in my article, I mentioned in passing the role of missionary uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, how the telling even the story of the missionary, the, 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 the story of the church in Africa is told from the perspective of the missionaries. And therefore, uh, all the effort and the, 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 the resistance and the contributions of um, the, the Africans themselves is missing in that type of telling of the story of the church. Um, and so uh, most of the times when you start actually telling the story from like, you pick up like nobody, like one time, like as the circle of concerned African women theologians, we started looking at the women that actually resisted the missionary enterprise. In Zambia, we have Alice Renshina. She started her own uh, church, which was resisting the missionary Christianity. In 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 Congo, we have uh, Kimpa, Kimpa, who was converted to Christianity, uh, Catholic Christianity, and she started her own version of Christianity that the missionaries didn't like, uh, but. In, so anyway, she ended up being killed. But it, so the telling, you start telling the story of the church from the perspective of the people themselves to see that they actually made a contribution that is very important. So they were not victims, inactive victims, but they were actually part of that which shaped the story of the church. So the telling, and then we have cultural uh, perspective. Uh, that he, uh, also sometimes can be, um, like I use Ubuntu, but he, you know that he, actually why I used in my theory, I, I call it feminist ethics of Ubuntu. It's because Ubuntu sometimes privileges the story of males. 
are not females. And so the feminist ethical uh, part of it is to really uh, critique that. And then I use Ubuntu because of the understanding that even the feminist ethics could live out the experience of black people. So the intersection uh, of all that multiple belonging and, and all that. So, yeah, so culture also, uh, we have we have to critique it in a way that it becomes not a burden that discriminates for others people, but it, it becomes really to serve the well-being of the people. Thank you. Um, our next question is really for uh, Dr. Esther. Um, asking for you to talk a little bit about the word reconcile um, and how it relates to this, um, this uh, not reversing, but this work on what's happened with this othering. Um, can you explain what, what that means and maybe unpack it a little bit? Yeah, for sure, reconcile is not the best word, but it's a word that is being used for the inclusive theology here in Brazil. Because reconciliation, it needs to be uh, think using the idea of rupture and continuity. Because we are human beings full of contradictions, uh, so always the center is trying to co-opt the margins, as in a concept that Marcela Altaus Libre calls uh, economy of inclusion. So we always need to be aware how the center wants to co-opt the, 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 the margins. Marcela also, she wrote a chapter called Gustavo Gutierrez, which was the liberation theologian. Gustavo Gutierrez goes, goes to Disneyland by saying, uh, because she wants to criticize how um, liberation theology was co-opted by the global north. So we are all, always need to be aware of this, the way of the center works. So one way for that she gives us is by building other centers of, uh, not power, but uh, centers of communion. Like she claimed, she says something, I have here, just a second, I, I would like to quote it because I think it's, it's a good quotation. Uh, she says, uh, the point by Marcela Altaus Reed, I'm quoting her, the point to consider now is how we can ever know theology from different centers, such as the center of the queer nation. This may not be called a theology from the margins anymore, but a theology from recognizable, legitimized, and visible centers, which have been rendered invisible. We need to reflect in the area of the different sexual ways of knowing which could be considered foundational for a new way of reflecting on God and on us. So it's less than being co-opted by the center of power, which already exists, by, but creating different centers and making this game more uh, fair. So reconciliation is not a passive thing then it is an at all yeah so i think yeah. that's getting that answers beautifully this question great Thank you so Thank much you. and our last one i think this would be a wonderful question to end on um this book um all of the essays in it are so full of emotion um and uh those who write and those who edit and those who read um, that's really what we're interacting with, is not just these um, scholarly theories, but also real experience and real emotion. Um, what did you learn from writing about these really emotional topics for you? Or for those of us reading and editing, what did you learn by interacting with those, those deep human responses? And how do you balance? Um, I think that's also part of the question. How do you balance um, those perspectives as well. I, th I love the question, um, which comes from one of my students. Um, and I would say it reminds us that scholars are human and it's okay to show that in, in your scholarly writing. And I think it's actually very helpful. Um, and so 
I mean, I heard the emotion in Fulata when you were talking about um, reading the letter that you wrote from your mother and how that helped you personally beyond helping you academically. Um, and so I think it's I think it's a good lesson for budding scholars too, to know that you don't have to shut down the human part of yourself and somehow be some sort of academic robot. Um, but it, it's also, I mean, uh, I think for me, um, writing scholarship that matters to people and communities beyond my own intellectual interest is, is another way to sort of channel those emotions um, toward good, toward justice, and to hope that this isn't just, you know, um, a book that might be read in a library somewhere, but it could actually impact people's lives and change the way that we, when we change the way that we think, we change the way that we relate to others in the world. Um, and so balancing the emotion, I think is challenge, challenging some of that into um, to scholarship that can actually impact the world in, um, in ways that improve justice. I echo that yeah. uh, because uh, early on in my career, I learned that feeling as messenger uh, it gives you another source of wisdom, not just mm. from here. And sometimes mm. when we touch our gut feeling, our theology or our work can be inspiring and moving. Unless, I think, the heart is moved, we will not rise up to action if it only stays here. When you are moved and then connect with the passion of that author, then we broaden our theological imagination. And as Masala said, touch the other side of God. Mm. Well, yeah, I, was, I was also thinking of, uh, is it uh, Brenna Brown? Brenna Brown who says he, it's probably data is, um, uh, the story is data with soul. Mm. You know, um, because I, I, I think most of us, like when I was writing, I, I find it very difficult <clears throat> to write about something that I'm not emotionally connected to. I, I find it like a waste of time for me because the, uh, I have to write about something that it will help me to also find, turn it to an opportunity for action. And so I think, we, um, yeah, so I think this, this book has done a very good job on that. Uh, I, I must confess that writing it in English is hard. Mm. So I think if I first thought about this chapter in Portuguese, it would be a totally different chapter because I'm a Latin American woman, full of emotion, full of passion. And if I'm not like the other said, if we are, we are not connected emotionally with the topic, nothing will come. But I always would love would like to encourage all the scholars to queer the way we do uh, we write, the queer the way we study, the queer our productions, you know, to give some tension to it, uh, uh, allowing ourselves to be in those papers because this is the richness that we can give to the world, is ourselves. So keep pressing on and queerizing our scholars. Uh, so, Anna, uh, well, sorry, I have to get back to you, Esther. Um, so, when this version, the, the book is being turned into Portuguese, would you love to rewrite your chapter mm -hmm. from a Portuguese, uh, sure, in a Portuguese sure. language? So that yeah. no one is, is well, not just translated not in that way. Yeah. yeah, that would be such a great idea. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. Well, this gives us all um, uh, an imperative to learn Portuguese um, because your essay was already so compelling. Um, and we've all learned so much that it's gonna be amazing when it's even more amazing. And when you feel like you can make, um, make that in your own language. I think this is a beautiful moment to end our time together today. Thank you so much for sharing uh, not only your work, but your time and your hearts with us as we had this conversation. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Womack, for facilitating this. Um, thank you Pleasure. all for your voices, for your pens, um, and continue to do the work. Um, and we are championing you mm -hmm. and the Candler Foundry are big fans. So thank you so much. Um, 
and join us next time, our audience, um, as we talk about Dr. LaRonda Little's book next month in April. Details coming up soon on that. So good day, friends. Thank you.